I see someone, a couple of people have joined us. I'm just going to wait a second and see the participation numbers go up a little bit before we start. But thank you so much for coming on board. And we've got lots of people joining now. This is awesome. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our Azores webinar. We are excited to do this. I think Azores sounds so exotic and lovely right now. I know we're going to gain a lot from all the, the things we're going to learn more about for this archipelago of Portugal. I think it sounds like a, an amazing uh, place to go, especially right now. So I'm excited that uh, I'm Carrie Allen. I'm the director of the Vanderbilt Travel Program. And we have been doing these uh, webinars now, as you know, those who joined us for the last one and very successfully. We're, we're having great, great fun with these and we're getting a lot of participation, a lot of people signing on. Clay Krebs, who, whom I work with, whom you have spoken to is behind the scenes, kind of keeping us straight today, as is Caroline Johnston. She is uh, making sure that we don't fail on our webinar. So great to have you here. Uh, let me just say that I am thrilled to have, I have a cat in the background, by the way, so you can pardon him from the, this is just being at home today, I guess, the way things are. But uh, Jim Berkeley, who is not only a Vanderbilt alumnus, but is also the president of Destinations and Adventures. He is leading this charge on this trip, as is Mara Papa Theodoro, who is a master foodie and one that knows a lot about what you're going to taste and see and do while you're in the Azores. It is a, a thrill to have them on because Mara brings an entirely, uh, not just travel based, but uh, terroir uh, from wine to food to volcanic. Uh, influences and that sort of thing to the Azores. So it's really going to be a lovely, lovely presentation. Just a little, uh, and I will tell you that this trip is August the 5th through the 13th. The brochure is online. It's a beautiful brochure. You just need to get on our website and we will have that at the end of the, we will tell you more about that at the end of the presentation, how to get on there and um, see that gorgeous brochure if you have not already. And we will also um, probably be mailing something about it at some point coming up soon. We're not quite sure if it'll be a full brochure or a postcard, but something will be there. And also you can always go online and call us about that. At the end, if you'll look down at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A uh, button and you can press that and submit your questions and we will address them either along the way or at the end of the presentation. So um, just know that you are, you are able to do that without interruption of anything. So <gasps> hope you will do that. Um, I think I'll just say in passing the, there we go. Thank you, Clay. I will say in passing that the vaccine is making us all more comfortable with travel. We feel very good about Portugal and what it is to go to Portugal right now, or especially that part of Portugal because it's so removed and they've done such a good job of containing things there. So everybody get their vaccine and let's go. That's my last word before we start. So Jim, without further ado, thank you for taking us through this awesome itinerary. Carrie, thank you very much. And uh, welcome one and everybody for joining this uh, uh, webinar on the Azores. It's a very exciting destination for us. And it reminds me of oh, one, one um, caveat before I even get started on this. Uh, I grew up in Mexico, so I'm fluent in Spanish. Um, and then at Vanderbilt, I tried one semester of Portuguese and it was a total failure in Portuguese. My tongue couldn't get around it. So consequently, every Portuguese name that I'll be mentioning in this proposal, in this presentation, <laughs> will be said with a Spanish accent. So I know you'll forgive me. So thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Um, but um, you know, it wasn't long ago that Iceland uh, was the sort of the flavor of the month. Now let's see if I can get, there we go, was the flavor of the month. 
And if you combined Iceland with New Zealand, which has always been a flavor of the month, you're going to get uh, the Azores. Uh, and really, the Azores is like a volcanic equatorial dream destination. It doesn't have the ice uh, of uh, Iceland, but it's got all the beautiful volcanic activities and uh, the beauty of nature. Um, and it's got some amazing flora and fauna that have only developed in the Azores. Look at that fantastic volcanic coastline. It's dramatic, it's exciting. This is the tall, this is Mount Pico, Pico Mountain, which is the tallest volcano, tallest mountain in Portugal for that matter. And then you've got these calderas sort of at every turn with the azure water, they're just stunning. So visually it's really uh, very satisfying. But as Kerry mentioned, uh, the Azores is incredibly isolated. It's 900 miles west of Lisbon, 900 miles north northwest of Casablanca, 1,200 miles southwest of London, and 1,500 miles uh, from Newfoundland. So it's it's in the middle of absolutely nowhere, and that works to its benefit, of course. It was in World War II. The Allies used it as a as a naval base, and also during the Cold War, it was used by both um, uh, all the Allied powers. Uh, the first settlers came here in the middle of the 15th century, uh, but it really wasn't populated until later in the last couple hundred of years. Um, and because of the way it was populated, the culture, dialect, cuisine, traditions are all, they all vary considerably between the islands. Hey Jim, could yes. you just pause for a moment? It sounds like we're not seeing your slides. So You're not seeing the slides. Yet we can just see the Vanderbilt Alumni Association image still. Uh, I'm not sure why that's happening. Let me see. I'm gonna stop your share and reshare. Let's, let's stop the share. Oh, there's stop. something. Stop the share and then let's try the, we'll do it, try it again. Share, sorry about that. Share screen, you're sharing. Okay, so we see, the Ace, we see the Azores, Portugal's hidden gems. Oops. I'm sorry, I hit the wrong one. That's sorry. okay. We'll try here. Let's try it again. All right. And let's see if it's working now. Did that work? Yes. Very good. So we went to the exotic flowers and then the dramatic volcanic coastline and Mount Pico. I'm just catching up on where we were. And then dramatic calderas sort of at every turn. Look at, look at that azure water. And then <clears throat> I was explaining that um, it's totally isolated. 900 miles is said, the closest place. London, 1,200. Newfoundland, 1,500 miles. And of course, COVID doesn't even know where the Azores is. Not 100% not true, but, but uh, here are the, some of the cute little villages that were uh, uh, settled in the last couple of hundred years. And they're all charming. They're all distinctive in their own little way. But of course, one common thing is volcanic stone all over the island. There are nine uh, major islands in three groupings. And we'll fly into San Miguel, which is on the lower right-hand side above Santa Maria, San Miguel, Sao Miguel, in, in my bad Portuguese, Sao Miguel, will fly from Ponta Delgada. And incidentally, there are nonstop flights from Boston on both Azores Airlines and the TAP. So that may be the best way to go. There are other ways to get there, but that may be the most convenient. It's only like a four and a half, five hour flight from Boston. And during this trip, we'll visit San Miguel. Then go in the middle of the screen, you'll see Pico Island. Um, whoops, all right. Pico Island. And then we'll take a ferry from Pico Island right north to Sao Jorge. So those are the three islands that we'll visit uh, during this trip. There, uh, I, love, I love this, I don't have, there is, this really makes no sense at all, except when I ran across this photo, I thought it was very whimsical for them to use uh, these, these blocks that they, erosion blocks for modern art, very clever. And of course you have to have Daisy the cow waiting for your arrival. So the three islands we'll visit again, we'll start with Pico Island. And again, that's Mount Pico in the back. Um, we'll start with a four by four excursion um, up to um, the beautiful lava flows 
and uh, laced with pine trees. And of course, you can't do anything in the Azores without a little wine tasting. But what makes wine tasting in uh, in uh, uh, wine tasting interesting is the way these vines grow. They crab onto the volcanic soil, and it's really something special. Um, Gruta de Torres, Torres Cave. These are uh, volcanic tubes that were created by the volcanic activity that created the islands. And the Azores has the longest volcanic tube uh, in the, it's uh, 3.2 miles long. We won't make you walk the whole way, but once you're inside, you're gonna be seeing stalactites, stalagmites, which I knew a lot about, but I didn't know about side benches, lava balls, striated walls, and lavas stranded. So you're gonna to get to learn about all that interesting uh, volcanic activity. From here, we'll take the ferry from Pico Island. We'll take that ferry, as I mentioned, to San Jorge Island. And the thing that is of most interest on San Jorge are the so-called fajas, which are on the north side of the island. And these are collapsed volcanic cliffs that have fallen into the ocean. And as you can see in the one in the distance, they have, um, built settlements on them, and sometimes they built entire towns on them. We'll have lunch uh, on that island uh, near beautiful Baroque uh, Santa Barbara Cathedral. Incidentally, these islands, Pico Island that I mentioned earlier is 29 miles long, 10 miles wide. Uh, San Jorge is smaller than that. And now we're, we've flown back from Pico now to San Miguel Island, which is Again, 10 miles wide, sounds similar, and 40 miles long, So, but they are very small. You can navigate these islands in a day. But um, San Miguel Island is most known for this beautiful um, uh, blue-green lake called, uh, that is up near the Sete Ciudades, which is the seven cities. And it's such a stunning lake. We'll see this from multiple views, multiple locations. And though it doesn't look blue-green now, depending on the color and the light at the time of day, get your cameras ready because it is the blue green lake. It's a, of course a volcanic crater, three miles across. And um, on the other side of the island is maybe Europe's best kept secret, which is called the Furnas, F-U-R-N-A-S, the Furnas region, which is a live volcanic showpiece of geysers, bubbling hot springs and cauldras. Um, here are the, um, uh, beautiful, uh, I went one slide too far. Here are the beautiful, what, what are called the fumaroles, and that's where they do their cooking under the ground using these volcanic tubes. Mara will tell you a lot more about that in a second. Uh, an unexpected treasure on the island of San Miguel is the Terra Nostra Park, and this is the perfect romantic English garden with uh, green lakes, um, winding pathways, basalt caves and exotic flowers from all over the world. And of course, there's a perfect English manor house as well, which is uh, unexpected. And then of course, a duck or two. So there you go. Um, and then finally, there's another lake uh, that we'll visit called Fogo Lake. And again, whether it's in the mist or in this stunning sunshine, it's really uh, an amazing, amazing view. So you can see that the nature really blessed the Azores in, in the same way that uh, Iceland and New Zealand are blessed. So you can see my combination. Now hotels, we're staying in two hotels. Well, this is our first um, a hotel on Pico Island. This is Aldera de Fonte Nature Hotel uh, made out of all volcanic stone and uh, set right on the Atlantic, of course, stunning views. And you know, you know, you might think about diving off that cliff, but maybe not. Uh, and rather, you should maybe hop into the pool. Uh, I love this this um, tip about the hotel. It's called Portugal's fifth most ecological hotel. Now, I don't know what one, two, three, and four are, but this one looks pretty ecological to me. But I got a kick that it's number five. And uh, again, the views over the Atlantic are amazing. Rooms are charming. They're not, they're not spectacular, but they're charming and quaint. Yeah. Uh, this is less charming, but very important. This is the hotel we'll stay at on San Miguel Island. It's the totally redone Grand Hotel, the Azores Atlantico. 
And um, though it doesn't look charming, it really is beautifully done, uh, renovated on the inside. It's right, as you see out that window from the restaurant, it's right overlooking the harbor and the Atlantic Ocean in location one in the center of town. Rooms are absolutely fine. And, uh, and the bar looks perfect to me. So uh, that's a quick overview. Um, and Carrie, if you agree, should we save questions on both segments to the end? Yes, please. That's a great idea. And, and you know, Jim, I know Mara will be going with you on the trip, but could you speak to who your ground kind of operator, director, leader will be while you're there? Yes, yeah, so uh, we have partners all over the world, as Carrie knows. And our partner in the Azores is actually our agent in, in Lisbon. Of course, uh, Azores is an autonomous region of Lisbon, like Madeira. And um, we've worked with him for years. And I spoke with him just last week. And we were talking about um, COVID and the Azores. And he said, well, you know, Jim, uh, Portugal had a really bad go of, of COVID about a month or two ago. I don't know if you all read about it in the news. But they had a really bad time. It got out of control. The hospitals were overrun as they have gotten over the last year. They closed the country down very ferociously. They got it under control. And now they're really, uh, he says, the, the infections have gone way down. And they're really quite positive uh, that uh, Lisbon, Lisbon and Portugal is going to open for the tourist season. Interestingly enough, he said the Azores of course, being as secluded as I've just shown you that it is, um, it had very minor uh, action with COVID. And, and then when they found COVID, because of the so small, they could do the contract tracing very well. So I think we're going to find that this is going to be one of those unique destinations in a post-COVID environment where it has everything that we want. It's secluded. It's not heavily traveled. Uh, we're going to do a lot of nature, things out in the wilds, no crowded cities. So it's sort of got everything going for it uh, on a post-COVID holiday. Mara, you want set me up? So I'm going to set up Mara at this point. Let's see if I can quick action that stop share here and uh, share screen over here. And um, thank you for everyone, your patience. and. That's it. Are you ready? I'm ready. And there you go. You want to go there? Yeah. Just click on that. Head. All right, guys, just getting resituated here. Okay, so. Hi, everyone. I'm, can you see me? Yeah. Yeah, on that arrow. I'm Mara Papathiodoro. As Carrie said, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, I am a master foodie, a taste and traditions expert, uh, a culinary historian, I suppose. How does one become a master foodie? I spent 12 years as the international travel editor and entertaining specialist for Bon Appetit magazine. So um, that sort of gave me my final chops in terms of understanding uh, the blends of culture and cuisine. I am uh, a traveler with a food perspective. So I handle my culinary compass in one hand and my passport in the other. And I'm very excited to take you through the flavors and flair of the Azores. Um, as Jim said, it's amazing archipelagos, uh, very different from mainland Lisbon. Um, and you know, the, it all starts with maps, right? And how travelers and uh, seafaring maritime merchants uh, sort of explored the world to gain territory and to find new commodities because the commodities began with nature, whether it was salt or uh, spices. Uh, and that was very true of the Portuguese. As you know, there were influences throughout Spain and Portugal. Um, Jim pointed out the differences of the different islands. And one of the interesting things is, although it's 900 miles from Portugal, considered part um, obviously of Western Europe, being on the Atlantic side, in, even with these beautiful vistas, um, it has a very different cuisine, which uh, we will experience. The truth is behind every taste is a tradition and behind every tradition there is a taste. And the tastes come from the sun, 
the sea and the soil. We call this the S factor in the food world. And that means, you know, the higher the sun, the lower the sun, the colder the ocean, the warmer the ocean, the wetter the soil, the drier the soil, the rockier the soil, that's all going to affect what grows and how it grows. And what's interesting about a volcanic island, they call it the Hawaii of Europe. Um, anywhere that there has been a volcano eruption, it obviously immediately affects uh, the soil and therefore what can grow and what will thrive there or not. Uh, it's interesting because even though it's a part of Western Europe, it has very common uh, crops, if you will, to things in Northern Europe, in the Baltic, where the wet soil, it's a combination of the wet and dry soil and in open air, you're going to have a very different uh, growth process. So the most important part of nature, every element that we eat starts with nature. And the, the three elements really are sea salt, honey, and grain. And these, especially on an island where you're not uh, surrounded by any place but what's available to you, you can survive with uh, bread and salt as the spice. Again, it is the number one commodity. The sea salt comes from the sea and honey because wherever there are bees, there is honey. Uh, the bread of Portugal and particularly the Azores is called bolo levedo. It looks like they call it the English muffin of Portugal and that's exactly what it's like, sort of an unleavened bread and uh, dry breads because again, taking the stone ovens, the bread will cultivate differently, the flour will raise differently. Um, and the, the one that is really special is the masa suvada, which is a salty, sweet, uh, almost like an Easter bread, a brioche type bread um, that can rise in the sun and using the salt and the honey, you'll find this uh, all over the islands. Fruits and vegetables. I'm gonna start with the fruits because they're so different here. In Western Europe, you don't necessarily, you find peaches and guava. There's a, a tropical element and lemons, oranges, figs, apples, kiwi, passion fruit, and berries, particularly strawberries. But the big surprises of the island that are very unique to the Azores are cherries. And if you think about it, that means the soil is very similar, let's say to the United States in Washington or Oregon, which, which is what? It has volcanoes. Cherries thrive in, in the soil of volcanoes. There are vitamins that enrich uh, the stone fruit to grow. So cherries are a big part of it as are bananas. And we think the bananas come because the Franciscan monks and the maritime explorers brought the seedlings to the Azores. Um, and you'll see them all over the island. But the biggest surprise of all are pineapples. And they don't, uh, this is one of the reasons they sort of are called the Hawaii of Europe. They don't grow and thrive <clears throat> the way they do in Hawaii. But the pineapple was brought to the Azores pretty late in the 40s uh, when they had had a plague and the citrus dried up. So uh, a plant was brought and the uh, pineapple thrived. It did well because there is a humidity, um, the weather with the mild uh, winds and breezes and the humidity in the open air, the pineapples thrive because it was close to the sea. And they now have hothouses all over the island and it's become known as the Pineapple Island of Portugal. And we will be visiting pineapple plantations and very much because the tastes come from what grows there, um, a lot of jams from the different fruits and most particularly, which we will experience and taste a lot of, are different liqueurs, pineapple liqueurs, passion fruit liqueurs, anything that blends, taking what's there and making it into something to enjoy. But like any kind of fruit, the most well-known, of course, is a grape, which brings wine and holy ritual. Remember the Franciscan months from the 14th and 15th century were some of the first to really come thanks to the seafaring explorers to the island. And they brought cuttings from Greece, Crete, we believe, and Spain. And because wine, grapes, and vineyards thrive there, uh, they thought if it could try. Now coming from Greece or coming from Italy and Spain, they're used to this, but they had been in Greece, we do know that. And so they understood because Santorini and other parts of Crete had stony, rocky uh, vineyards. This is a vineyard in Pico. And you can see this is very different from what you would find in Italy or Spain. But again, making use of how it works and how it grows, as Jim pointed out, 
can see, it looks like nothing's happening there um, except a lot of stones, but that's what's happening. And similar to how Greek wine is made in Santorini, when you're in an open island, it's high wind, high sun, um, but also damp nights, cooler nights. And so they figured out how to get the vines and plants to grow there. And they've developed quite a wine culture. Um, the most prominent is the white wines, the Madero grape it's called. We're going to be visiting um, the wineries. Again, seeing using the stone as Jim pointed out, um, really being resourceful in all that they do. The wine is marked a uh, Robert Parker in the high 90s. It's uh, the Portuguese wine, Vino Verde, which is a younger, similar to a Pinot Grigio. So again, the Portuguese winemakers bringing their knowledge, the Spanish winemakers bringing their knowledge to the island and creating quite a commodity. And so we will be getting to taste uh, wines uh, throughout our trip uh, and enjoy them, of course, through um, our meals. So whether it's white rosé or red, rosé is trying to make a mark there. Um, it's, it's sort of the new wine. It never went away as the French Provençal will tell you, but um, the red, because it's a sweeter red, again, the higher the sun, the sweeter the wine, it seems to be working. Madeira port is on the island, but it does not, it's not cultivated there. It comes from mainland Portugal, as Jim had pointed out, Madeira is a little bit um, a different part of the country, but uh, so it's really the sweet liqueurs and the white and red wines. The other thing besides vineyards, this is the only Chai Gorana, which we will be going to, is the only tea plantation in Europe, if you can imagine. Again, the weather similar to tea areas in the world like India or Vietnam, the high sun and the wet moist soil helps, the humidity thrives. Um, it is regarded as one of the most respected tea plantations in the world um, and they make green tea, black tea, herbal teas. Um, so we'll be enjoying a lot of that. And, and that is an unexpected surprise. And again, sort of as we're talking about these unique hideaways, um, this is very well known in the culinary and tea world, but not something we think about naturally. So definitely tea to drink there and to bring home. Uh, coffee, the Spaniards brought, and, and the Portuguese themselves, the Brazilians brought coffee roasting to Portugal. Um, there do not grow coffee beans there, but the roasting is unique and a lot of espressos. It's a stronger coffee. Um, moving on to vegetables, of course, you're going to have your onions and your garlic, similar to the Mediterranean. But again, the potatoes and the yams um, and the cabbage and the carrots, um, they thrive in colder, wet soil uh, and less sun. So they can grow actually any time of year. And that's why you see it more in the Scandinavian cultural cuisine. But it does, this is a unique blend, the Azores, of mixing the Atlantic and elements from the Mediterranean of the Western European, the milder breezes. They don't have the coarse, the coarse cold, but the cold and the dampness being out in the open so much uh, brings on different vegetables. But you also have cucumbers. And interestingly enough, tomatoes, similar to any volcanic area like Santorini in Greece, um, or in other parts in Oregon, for instance, in the United States, tomatoes are sweeter, Naples, Italy, because volcanic soil is their friend, the nutrients of that that aren't cannot be anywhere but where there has been lava affect the sweetness and the, um, the bounty of the tomato. It's a richer tomato. Um, in fact, it's a healthier tomato. So you see tomatoes throughout the island and in the cuisine and very well known for their tomato jam. It's a preserve, preserve actually, uh, often served with cheese or on bread uh, as an hors d'oeuvre. Um, also, any place that there's open air, particularly in a mountainous area with sea nearby, herbs thrive there. Uh, rosemary loves hot sun, uh, again, similar to the Greek islands or some of the Spanish islands, um, and mint. They both do very well in the high sun. Coriander, however, likes sun, but also appreciates shade. And so those elements are there. Um, the rumor is that some of the French explorers made their way to Portugal and brought the lavender seeds. So lavender does grow there, not in the uh, way that it grows in Provence or in Croatia Havar, but it's there and it's used in the cuisine. So we will taste that particularly in their drinks and in their desserts. But savory spices, as I mentioned earlier, commodities were the way of the of, of 
paying for things, learning about things. You know, trade routes are what expanded the culinary elements around the world. And so what came from one place to another came because of the explorers, because of the Franciscan monks and people bringing seedlings and elements that worked in places that were similar to war or sun and areas like that. So we're going to have a lot of good spices peppers and peppercorn. Peppercorns do very well in high heat, but again, they have the cool shade and the pepper um, and the spices really come through in Portugal. A surprise is the cumin, probably coming from um, the Arabic uh, trade routes and onto the monks who brought the cumin um, and sweet spices. The biggest spice that you're going to find in the Azores as a pleasant surprise is cinnamon. Again, the area is similar uh, to the tea plantations of Vietnam where the sweet and the wet soil creates and thrives in that way. It's the lusciousness that lets that grow. You know, when you're on an island, it's nothing but resourceful. So what are currants but dried grapes? And the grapes that are too, uh, mature for a white wine or make a, a sort of sour red wine, what do you do? You dry them in the sun and you use them in your desserts or in your sweet liqueurs. The liqueur of Portugal is Biero and it's an interesting drink because it's sweet. Um, it sort of, it fuses mint and uh, lavender and rosemary, and it sounds odd and awful, but it actually is very good. It began medicinally. Everything is very good for you. And um, it's now become sort of the celebratory drink. We'll be tasting it along with other uh, sweet liqueurs, as I said. Uh, Jim introduced you to Daisy the cow. Um, you will see cows all over the island. Again, a little different. The Azores, similar to Ireland or uh, the Baltic where it's lush. So you're going to get a lot of dairy and fantastic butter and cheeses. The Azor cheese is unique. Again, the Portuguese, the Spanish coming to the island brought their cheese making abilities. Um, but we're going to go to the San Jorge Island, which is, this is the only place you can have this cheese. Um, you can get it in mainland Portugal, but only if they distribute it there. And it's um, delicious. It's sort of camembert meets brie uh, meets uh, and uh, a creamier, milkier goat's cheese. So it's a little bit of everything, but it's the cow's milk that makes such a difference to the cheese. Um, and this is trademarked as the only cheese. You'll see the cows everywhere. So beef is, and pigs bring on charcuterie and meats, meats and potatoes and pork. And these caldera ground ovens, which Jim talked again about, um, they literally bury pots into the ground uh, filled with different meats, pork, potatoes, cabbage, carrots, and it stews for five to seven hours. And this is what you get. We will be experiencing this. So it's, it's delicious. Again, the sun, the sea, the soil, nature bringing forward an amazing meal. Seafood, we're right on the ocean. So of course that makes sense. Tuna is the most uh, prominent uh, fish on the menu, cooked. Uh, cods and sardines, you will see them dried this way. Um, you'll see it baked. And barnacles, which is really sort of, uh, they're called limpets. And they're sort of a combination between a snail and a clam used with lemon and butter and delicious. We will taste them. Mussels and smoked fish. Sardines, again, the Portuguese and the Spanish bringing um, the ability to cook them, but they, they are in the waters. Shrimp and a, a slipper lobster. So similar to the Caribbean lobster, a little, not like the New England lobster, lobster so they like the warm, cold water. Um, and the caldera Portuguese fish stew. So this is similar to a bouillabaisse um, and it may become similar to a paella. They often throw rice in it. And then we go to the sweet, finale, the Portuguese pastries. Masada, which is a donut, and they fill it with different jams of the fruits that we've seen, pineapple, berries, uh, passion fruit. The sweet custard pie, again, using the eggs and the creams of the region, um, and really a custard. Cheesecake, using the cheese, it's a custard cheesecake combination with honey and powdered sugar. And pineapple cake, again, using what's there. Um, we'll have a lot of that. And pavlova, they, they brought uh, berries and meringue came via the monks. Um, so they do have a pavlova, although as Jim touched on originally from New Zealand, but it's made its way to the Azores. And lemons using the citrus. 
tiles are the other um, sort of artisan thing to bring home between the liquor, the liqueurs and the teas and tiles. The uh, Portuguese and the Moors, the Spanish Moors influences uh, are all over Portugal, including the Azores. So in, exciting because, you know, food does unite us, whether we live to eat or eat to live. Um, it is something that we can all experience and you really get an amazing inside understanding of culture. And really it's important to remember from person to person, culture to culture, dish to dish, the world really does become a smaller place around the table, especially in these times. So to go to the Azores and embrace this culture, experience this cuisine, I think we're in for a unique and delicious, delightful experience. I hope you'll join us. Thank you. Let's see, hold on, let me get, uh, are we not we're muted? Sorry, there we are. Um, thank you so much. That was, could we just eat and then hike and then hike some more and then eat some more? You can more? burn it off. <laughs> we can burn it off because I want to eat everything you featured. My gosh, that looks divine. So um, that was a great trip to the Azores. We've had a couple of, we've had a couple of questions. And um, Jim, I think that one of the things you had said to me was, well, first of all, Mara, are we going to be able to accommodate dietary restrictions on the trip? Yes, we are. And, you know, like any trip that we do, we always ask for those in advance. And um, we're very good about being able to alert people. And because I'm there too, if something needs to change in the moment, we always make accommodations for that. Um, so not to worry at all. Um, you know, we well, really- Well, my experience has been that you all are great at that. And so much so that the person will be sitting at the table and they'll come right to you with the dish that's appropriate for that person. That's so, right. That's thank right. You. <clears throat> yeah, that's terrific. And the other question that was posed was, will be, I know, Jim, you had talked a lot about the leisure time that you will be afforded while you were on the trip. It's not going to be constant go, go, go. And one of the questions is, is there scuba diving available? Right. No, there's not, not to my knowledge, there is not. And I'll double check with our agent, but I have not been aware of any scuba diving in the Azores. Well, I, what we do know um, in terms of water activities, and we've talked to our agents, there is whale watching, there is swimming right. with dolphins. Um, and obviously the thermal springs that Jim touched on um, are really a wonderful experience. And what we're going to do for those that join us on the trip, once we know who you are, um, we have, uh, deliberately scheduled leisure time and we can make um, arrangements they're on they're ready to go um, you know so when we know who wants to go and do what um, particularly the water activities whale watching to may to september so we're going to be there at, at a wonderful prime time to experience all mm -hmm. these things so water activities yes um, scuba diving well, I'm, we'll i'll we'll check. check i'm yeah. not aware of it snorkeling I, i'm not or maybe aware. snorkeling yeah and if it is available, we can make it available yeah, to any sure. traveler. Horseback sure. ride. Yeah. There's another question I see here, Carrie, about the flights from the States. Yes, please. Yes, and of course, we'll be glad to help anybody with their flight arrangements uh, once they are booked on the program. And Jim, talk a little bit about your, um, you have a new cancellation policy that will help people get really excited about signing up. Well, yes, you know, <laughs> we, you know, like everyone else, we are trying to kickstart the travel industry again. And so we are being as flexible as possible. Uh, we obviously need to have the same deposit requirement, but that deposit's going to be fully refundable up to 60 days when the final payment is due. That is a huge, a huge influencer, I think, on people's, you know, they feel relieved that they can do that. And thank you. And also, uh, just so you all will know on the call, we offer trip insurance that we give to everyone uh, as, a, as an optional thing to buy. It's very helpful. We hope you will look at it carefully and go with that because sometimes things happen and it's good to have that. Um, trying to think anything else, Jim, I will say this about destinations and adventures as a whole. They're a very customized product for you. So if you want to go on and do something else, if you want to take a trip 
into Portugal or Spain, you wanted to go back via London, you want to do something like that. Those accommodations can be made too. So you can make a big trip out of it if, if all things are good and we can do that. Or we can just go to the Azores and come back. That's a very good point, Carrie. And, and back to those flights for a second. I did mention the nonstops out of Boston to uh, Ponte Delgado, but you could choose British Airways, as you say, go via London, have a stay over in London, come down British Airways, flies right into the Azores. Uh, if any Air France does from Spain, Portugal, you, innumerable places you could do your uh, air connections and then augment your trip based on that air selection. That's, and I think also, you know, the great thing about the islands is in terms of understanding it, since probably people haven't been there, it's, it's similar to going to the Caribbean or going to the Greek islands where, you know, you get to one place to get to the next and then it's, it's uh, safe and beautiful and, you know, a wonderful experience. So, um, August, as you mentioned, is a good time to go. And so I'm assuming that it will be warm because it is summer. And, it, and you know it is the summer but it won't be oppressively warm it, so it'll be a very good time to so, go yeah i didn't mention earlier on the the annual temperatures range it's very moderate because of the gulf stream yeah. well you wouldn't imagine that the gulf stream goes that far east from uh, from the gulf but it does so 61 is the sort of the low average to 77 and we're going during the summer months so we'll be ticking on the average of 75 77 during the day, it'll be absolutely perfect. It'll be perfect. And you know, it's interesting. That's why the food is a little different. There is mild humidity. It's not oppressive humidity. Um, and so that that's sort of pleasant. And the evenings, a cooler, you know, gentle breezes. Um, you're not into high wind area. So this blend of, of sort of Western European influences, but as Jim said, you're on the Gulf Stream Atlantic. So it's, it's very pleasant. That, is, that sounds so inviting right now. <laughs> let's go yeah. can we go tomorrow let's go well we're not quite in spring yet here so all warm weather sounds great <laughs> um i will tell you all as a group um that we have had great encouragement this past two weeks specifically we've had lots of reservations coming in and for one of jim's trips to egypt we've had a good response to that so it seems that people are really looking for exotic destinations uh, ones that they really always had on their list, but they suddenly just say, let's go. So I encourage you all to look at this trip and all of our trips, but particularly this Azores trip, we will not repeat this trip uh, for several years because it's unusual. And um, we feel like once it gets hot, and as Jim said, it is a hot destination, but once it really gets hot, you won't want to go. You will have already said, I've been there, so I don't need to worry about it now. But I do think it's a grand opportunity to really um, to really go to someplace unique. So we do have, and Clay, thank you for saying this, we do have our website that Clay has just sent to everybody to be sure you check that out. That is also where our brochure for the Azores is housed. Just go down to Azores, go down and you'll, on Europe, and you'll click on it. And that full brochure is there, it's beautiful. Any other questions from everyone? And thank you, by the way, for your questions. Anything else from R and Jim or for the Vanderbilt Travel Office right now? Sit here and wait a second. And if um, not- it's great. it's great to be uh, answering all their questions. I know. <laughs> thank you. This is fantastic. Thanks for everybody for being on the call. We are here for you. Just give us a call. We will take your reservation. We'll get it over to Mara and Jim. We'll make all your accommodations for you as far as airlines and things like that. So, ah, I got a question. Yeah. Oh, the website address disappeared. Okay. Uh, Clay, can you get that out to everybody again, please, sir? My website. How much deposit will be required? Thank you. Um, let me see. Um, I know I can't, it, it varies. So that, you're not always absolutely I think sure. $1,500 per person. Yep. And let me also say one thing that's interesting to note this trip will operate with 10, 15 people. 
This will not be a big group of people. So you will never feel like you're wandering around with a big group from the United States and you'll feel awkward in any way. It's a small environment, small number of people. It just makes it a lovely, lovely way to, way to travel. And the other thing, Carrie, in terms of, you know, this gives us the wonderful opportunity to do the tastings um, and yes. the dinners. Um, and also, we've, we, as we said, we put in leisure time so that you can uh, plan activities, but also there'll be, we can do dinner together. As We have a few planned dinners, as you'll see on the itinerary, so that you really embrace the traditional uh, elements that I'll be explaining as we go. But there'll also be time either for dinners with friends you're making or friends you're traveling with with us or without us. So, you know, we're really <laughs> conscious and respectful of time together and time on your own as a vacation. So, um, you know, that, but the fact that it is a more unique trip uh, and it gives us an opportunity to really get behind the scenes and have these terrific um, cultural and culinary experiences. Carrie, uh, I wonder if I might just mention one more thing about tra traveling in a, in a post COVID world. Yes. Um, we already have, e Egypt is a country that opened up uh, last October, and we had a slew of bookings over the holiday season of people that were just, you know, dying to go for one reason or another, including families, four, just eight people. Um, and Egypt uh, adopted the World Health Organization protocols for reopening their country to tourism. And what did that mean? Now, it meant that hotels would be open to 50%. All uh, buffets would be closed uh, and room for room service becomes uh, emphasized. Um, there's uh, proper dining um, space between what is it called um, social distancing okay. in all the restaurants. Uh, Check-in is done, uh, you know, very carefully with everybody is masked. There's hand sanitizer everywhere. And when people go then touring during the day, all vehicles like the hotels are mandated to be occupied no more than 50%. So if you had a you know group of eight, they'd have to be in a vehicle that at least held 16 or 20. So everybody could spread out. Obviously the guides are all masked. The drivers are masked. Everybody's using hand sanitizer for the, for groups that are a little larger, everybody's using earpieces. So we have an, an indication already from Egypt that adopted the European World Health Organization travel protocols, how it's going to be in Europe. So when Portugal opens and for this trip in the Azores as well, I'm sure we will be looking at those same types of protocols. And I will say that uh, we have had not one issue with anybody, you know, either being denied entry. Of course, they had to get a proper PCR test in advance to be able to you know, get on the plane to fly and arrive Cairo. Um, but then we had people that carried on. People went from Cairo to Johannesburg as an example, and we were able to get them PCR tests in Cairo and even in Luxor, if you can imagine, and so they could carry on on their trip. So similarly, this will if someone wants to join the Azores trip, maybe then continue on into Europe, you know, you'll probably be required to have a PCR test and I'm sure we can arrange any ongoing travel based on those parameters. Or if you've had the vaccine, you just have your documents with you. As well. So, yeah. Exactly. And I think we were talking about it this morning for everyone to know that each country is just, as Jim says, it's unfolding a different um, requirement or a different entry or or disembarkation, you know, however they're doing it, it will be made known to us. We don't know everyone at every time right now, but we will know. And so I plan when my second vaccine comes around, I'm just going to put my vaccine card in my passport. I, have I think that, uh, that's where I'm going to keep it. You know, um, I plan on using that and, and going forth. So I hope you all will do the same thing as that. Anything else before we go? Great question. Great questions. These are good questions to really get you going on this thing. Anything else? All right. Jim, Mara, anything to close? No, just kind no, of. Thank you so much. Right we there. look forward all to right. seeing everybody uh, in the Azores. Thank you all for joining us so much. We will have this, it is recorded, and we will have it on our website for those that have been unable to join us. We will get it, we will get it to them, or it will be on our website to view again. So thank you again. We look forward to, to, to talking to all of you all about this.
Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.